Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Merlin, the 1998 miniseries, thoughts. I guess I'll start with the ending, or endings. I don't have any kind of problem with the way Merlin defeats Mav. It makes perfect sense that forgetting her, you know, turning their back on her is what's required, you know. I'm confused by why that couldn't have happened, excuse me, much earlier in the film. Excuse me. Did, like, uh, okay, well, what I actually could see was, like, that it drained her magic to, I don't know, raise more dread. Well, she didn't use that much magic, did she? I guess giving him toys and such, spoiling him. But, yeah, you know, it, it should have been better, kind of, established. Why, why is she suddenly... Why can he do that? W would it have worked if he had gotten a bunch of other people and, you know, stand in front of her and then turn their backs on her at, like, the beginning of the film? You know, did he c could he just not find her and now she was suddenly hanging out at the round table? Was that it? You know? And it's also just, like I said in the review, anticlimactic. You know, you have this big battle and then... It just kind of ends with, well, we're going to turn our backs on it. And, and then you have just the minor detail of the fact that almost everyone who turned their backs on Nab had just dodged a fireball. I'm sorry, at that point, I, I might not ignore her. I might actually kind of, and you know, nice of you, Merlin, to, you know, just let innocent people almost be slaughtered because you couldn't deflect that one. And then we have the happy ending. It would have been perfect if it had just ended with her trapped in the rock and him going through the rest of his life lonely. Because they made their choices and that is their character. You know, I get that, oh, but they did nice so they should be rewarded. Yeah, but... So much of this has been such pragmatic realism, you know, it, you throw magic in there, sure, but this is essentially a story of stuff that happened, stuff that actually happened, and the way it would actually happen. You know, a bunch of these things that you see in the movie, you know, fights over the throne, a king waging war on some of his own people just to have sex with someone he was, you know, who was already married. Stuff like this has happened, you know, and that's what makes it so great. It's relatable. It's believable. And then you suddenly have this just pulled out of nowhere. Deus Ex Machina kind of, oh, well, her spells are now, you know, so, oh, and here's that horse for no reason other than here's the horse. I, I don't know, I, I liked the horse earlier, but did they really have that strong of a relationship together? I, I thought that it was mainly there so that he could, you know, talk back and forth with it in that one scene where, you know, the horse actually brings up some pretty good points, you know, Kudos to Mr. Ed. You know, the, the whole thing with, you know, oh, the ends justify the means, you know, and that, that sort of thing, you know, it really... But yeah, so... I should talk briefly about their choices. She chose not to tell him that he would not be able to return. That, that's... Is, wasn't that that she knew, but... And he didn't because she had talked to Mab and then, yeah, something like that. So she decided that she would not put that pressure on him. She knew 
that the most important thing, you know, to her, the most important thing was that he was happy. And she knew that the most important thing to him was the happiness of others, of the country. He wanted to be happy himself, but the most important thing to him, at least at that point, had become making sure that the country had a good king, making sure that its future was, you know, ensured. And so those are their choices, you know, it, and that's, and, and you live with your choices, you know, I'm sorry, but that would have made the characters so much stronger and the ending so much more compelling. They both gave up the love of their life, you know, well, basically to, you know, well, her to make the love of her life happy and him to ensure the happiness and good fortune of others. You know, this is the nature of love, of selflessness. And you go and, you know, just completely destroy it by having them meet up. And then, just to rub salt in the wound, you have this... Oh, I got some more magic in me, let's just make us young, because, you know, if you can't... You know, what appearances is everything, you know, that's just... I understand the sort of notion of, you know, well, we want to spend our entire lives together. But again, they made the choice, you know, I just... I really don't think it's a... It's a good thing to have stories where, you know, just because you make a difficult choice, that means you necessarily get rewarded. You know, I, I'd hate to think that a lot of people actually think that they will necessarily be rewarded for making tough choices and maybe like, maybe they'll make a couple of tough choices, then see that they're not getting rewarded, and then the next time they get a tough choice, they'll just take the easy way out because they want to be rewarded, you know. It would have, again, if they had at least kept them as old and like this kind of thing, you know, this romantic thought of we, mo we may only have a few lives, a few lives, a few years left of our lives, but if, you know, if we get, at least get to spend them together, then that's worth much more than, you know, it, it would be better than spending our entire lives with someone else or without each other, you know, that would at least have helped make that a bit. But anyway, I do want to get to talking about the really positive stuff about the film. I... I thought the handling of the sort of, you know, the, the burning of her was quite nice and that, that, that also kind of you know, she wants to go back to being, you know, this flawless kind of beautiful. And, you know, he doesn't seem as, you know, bothered. Because, again, that's love. You accept each other. And it's not about the physical appearance. It's about the character of this other person. You know, what, what kind of person are they? Now, the... I liked how, I guess I could try to be a little bit chronological for the rest of this, or at least for the next little bit. Rutger Hauer, King Vortigern, how he actually almost, you know, he gets a lot of use out of, a lot of mileage out of Merlin, but at first, he wants the guy's throat cut, you know, because he thinks, well, it, it's blood that we need, so I'm not going to question that, so we're just going to go with that. And, you know, later, he actually, yeah, he gets a lot of, and, and it's because, you know, kind of, one part, in its Nimue's doing, you know, Rosalini's character, who makes sure that he's out of jail, and also that thing of, you know, well, I didn't, excuse me, I didn't see the entire vision, so, you know, I need to be outside of prison in order to... Yeah, you can tell Howard's kind of, yeah, okay, I know what you're doing, but I'm gonna let you do it, whatever. And 
you know, that his, you know, and he refuses the tear, you know, what is that line? The, the one tear shed over him could have saved him, but he was too stubborn to, you know, that he's that proud, you know, and he also has that line, a lot of people think before they act, I act before I think, you know, it, that really characterizes him, and yeah, that, that really fit, and you also have this, you know, if he, he wouldn't have, you know, set the dragon at Nimue if it wasn't that he believed the lies and illusions of Mab and Frick. You know, that... He, he even comments on it. He says, after Frick in disguise comes in and announces, excuse me, that Nimue's father, I don't remember the name, has betrayed him. You know, he, he actually says, well, that's convenient, but he doesn't further question it, you know, because he doesn't trust anyone and he he acts before he thinks, you know. So you have that kind of thing, and that's why Mab has such an easy time of, you know, tricking him. And I like that Mab actually put Merlin in a position where, because she doesn't want him dead, she just wants to make sure that he, you know, kind of earns the position. You know, if she just said to Vortigern, you know, you just you, you need this guy as a science advisor or something, you know. It, yeah, it, it just wouldn't have been quite as, you know. I think it's also her way of sort of toying with, with him. That she specifically says, well, you know, you need his blood. I like that, you know, once, once Uther is in power, you know, I, I, I think it's vital to note that it's not until he has power that he goes after this woman who's already married and has a child, no less, you know, that you do have this, you know... It's, it's that thing of power corrupting, you know, once he, you know, he, he might have wanted her before, but, you know, if he had met her before, I think that the idea is that he meets the wife for the first time, you know, what's her name, migraine, eyegrain, egrain, something like that. I guess that's why he had to force himself, oh, that's horrible, I'm going, yeah, whatever, sorry about that. Anyway, he, you know, he would probably not have thought to actually, you know, wage war to be this woman if he wasn't king. But he now feels like he, well, I'm king, I can do what I want, I'm, I want that, I'm entitled to it, you know. And I like that Morgan can see through it, and just the face, you know, Uther's face, you know, alight with randiness as he approaches, is just, you know, just despicable, just ugh. And, I don't know, I, I was a little, I wasn't entirely sure if it was just because it was another person, or if it was like, that she had some kind of inclination towards that, which I guess it could be. I'm, I'm told that that was an old idea that, you know, people who weren't entirely attractive had more of a leaning towards, you know, the dark arts. And I like that Morgan's, you know, this thing of she sees Merlin do the, the trick and she's like, ah, oh, that's just a part of the trick. Everyone can do that. And, or it's a twick. She wants to see Twix, you know, the chocolate bar hasn't even been invented yet, I don't know what she's on about. And then when Frick shows up and, you know, provides Twix, complete with caramel, he, you know, she's like, oh, that's real magic, you know, I, I kind of like that. And just, yeah, the, the whole relationship between the two of them, I really liked how for a while, he stays in the disguise of being a handsome young hero. 
you know, first he just dons that disguise again to remind her. And then he stays in it for a while. And then once she is dying, you know, they both change back. You know, she becomes, you know, the less attractive version that she really was. You know, the illusions fade. And both of them say, you know, am I, am I beautiful beyond words? You know, that was perfect. Again, you know... True love, that is, you know, going beyond the, you know, the, the fish, fis, visual, physical appearance, visual appearance, something like that. And, you know, that he actually sort of you know, quits from Mab after that, you know, I thought that was really good. That, you know, and you always had that sort of sense about him, that he was sort of the, you know, he didn't want to serve the dark. He, you know, and, yeah, he, he had it in him to be better, and, you know, then he does become it, and he, you know, goes fully for being human. Briefly, I do also gotta say back to the, I forgot to mention, with the horse still being alive, how old would that horse have to have been by then, you know, anyway, magic, you know, don't have to explain, anyway, with the whole Uther thing, you know, so after that, she, you know, Morgan Le Fay decides that she deserves the throne, you know, I guess because, you know, her, her father was killed by the king, and the king then, you know, had sex with her mother, and then, you know, and, you know, yeah, Arthur, and just the, the you know, and, the, and then you have the, the incest. I, I am not entirely sure if the incest between Morgan and Arthur is supposed to, I mean, in the olden days, incest was common in kingdoms. You know, you actually they actually figured that it was better because their blood was blue. Their, excuse me, their, you know, they were inherently better. So having sex with someone who wasn't royalty would, you know, so, you know, they, they tried to, you know, combine with the, the royalty of other countries, but sometimes it was, yeah, the family. And... So, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it, it's presented as something negative in this mini. So, I don't know. I guess... I guess maybe what it is, is Morgan is that determined, you know, that she's that evil, that she's willing to, you know. And I really do like how her... Her son, you know, Mordred, you know, right from when he's a kid, right from when he's young, is just this horrible little spoiled brat, you know, and how Mab spoils him with all these presents and things. You know, that's why he grows up to be a psychopath. You know, he expects that he should have everything, and that's why he's so decidedly going after the throne, you know, with no... Yeah, you know, and that's also, in the end, what slays him. His lack of discipline, his, you know, his his idea that he's better and that he, you know, it will work out for him. Because it always has, you know, he never had to work for any of those treats. So, he just stabs Arthur in the side and, you know, figures, you know, well, I, you know... I got you with that, so, you know, dude's got Excalibur, and he's over you. Obviously, he, you know, you need to actually finish him off and be sure that he's dead, or, yeah. So, the... I also thought that the acting of Mordred was, you know, quite good once he grows up and becomes real emo. 
and the the infidelity between excuse me there's both with you know Guinevere and Lancelot I'm, I'm gonna go with Lancelot I think that's the one and then there's also with you know yeah there, there are a couple of cheating couples in this and I think what we what we can take from that is in part that it affects more than the three people involved, you know, because Guinevere is actually sentenced to death because, and again, this is this is how I understand it, if she had a child with someone who wasn't the king, and people didn't know about that, and you know, back then they didn't have DNA tests, then that kid might grow up to be king, even though he doesn't have the royal blood of her husband, the king, in him. So, you know, suddenly we have a commoner ruling the country, and we can't have that. So the solution is, if she ever cheats at all, even if it doesn't seem like she's getting pregnant, you know, even if it was only once, or whatever, just, yeah, condemned to death, you know. And the, the consistent manipulation of Mordred with that, you know, oh, look, he condemned her to death, but then he just had his wizard saver. And, you know, he didn't even have the guts to have her, you know, saved by, it. you know, that was a really good, uh, you know. And then there's the battle between them. Speaking of battles, I also quite like how Arthur, you know, you have that bit with him going up to the general of the other army and saying, you know, if you really think that you should be king, then take Excalibur and cut my head off. You know, and this sort of thing of, you know, he could kill them. He, he, he could presumably win, but he doesn't want conflict because Merlin taught him ethics, you know. I suppose that is more or less it. I like Mam's voice, but I do gotta say, I consistently felt like offering her something against that strep throat. You know, that... I did like what they sort of did with the, the Lady of the Lake, sort of keeping it slightly out of sync. You know, that... It's, yeah, it just flowed, you know, and kind of... I don't know, it just, it had a quality to it that I thought was fitting. I like that Merlin kind of, you know, takes the sword away from Uther and, you know, says, oh, well, I'm just going to enchant it, you know, and he just jabs it into the rock. And after that, you know, Uther could have had Merlin killed. Vortigern would have had, have had him killed. Again, you, you see there is distinct differences between these different characters, you know. And while Uther might be as harmful a king, and that, you know, that's also a very important comment that I think can also be derided, derived from this. I would hope no one derides it. That not everyone is fit to rule. You know, it takes a very special kind of person, a very certain type of person to have power and not abuse it and to actually really help the people that they're supposed to help with this power. You know, and, and again, you could really see a difference between, you know, the first couple of kings and then Arthur. You know, well, except for maybe King Constant, because we never knew what he was like at all. Except, you know, I think we're told that he was a tyrant. You know, I, I like how, I, I like the juxtaposition of King Constant was the first Christian king of England with King Constant yelling, kill all the hostages! You know, that, yes, that is Christian right there. That was really, that was pretty funny. And I think it was intentionally so. I suppose. I suppose that more or less covers it. Yes, 
I believe that's everything I had to say. So, yeah, I, if there's anything else you can think of that you like my thoughts on or something, just put it down there. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.